hands up, uh, make sure you type your questions into the app. Um, I'm going to open it up. Uh, they all look, uh, I'm not going to ask you who you think is best in terms of uh, integrated care and uh, what you're doing. So, uh, but I'll start off by just asking a really practical question, which is, is one that comes up quite often and one that's come up certainly in terms of the, the app. So um, information governance. So historically there have been issues around information sh information sharing uh, across a, a local health system I, I know certainly even when I've heard uh, presentations before from NHSI even accessing the data that NHSE have got um, has been difficult so could you just give us a little bit about how you've addressed that challenge do you want me to get us started please Duncan please um, so I mean one of the features of the Nottinghamshire uh, project um, and it's been a frustration but also an advantage is we're trying to build something with NHSE uh, I and D just flicks off the tongue that NHSE I and D uh, England Improvement and Digital and in particular with NHS Digital to get us into a place where what we build can be scalable so the tests we're having to apply are tests which NHS Digital are going to be comfortable with for data sharing arrangements across the country. And at the heart of that is how do you get all of the myriad of businesses out there that are GPs to share their data? Now there are two aspects of that as the question kind of gets to. One, they've got to be willing, which works on trust and a lot of what Paul was describing earlier. But the other is about architecture and ensuring you've got the right question. And Lee might elaborate a bit later on on the right question about how it's easier for us if you ask the right question and it's clinically led. But I'll go to the architecture point. The architecture point is uh, if you can use the, uh, the setup of um, the data structures that the NHS already has in place, and the rules and allowances that the NHS has already in place, then, you're in a, then you stand a chance of doing this in the next two or three years rather than in the next ten years. And the key to that is using an individual called the DESCRO. So this is a person who has data handling responsibilities within each county. Uh, and the aim of the architecture we're putting together is if you run all the architecture going from the providers, whether they're GPs, community trusts, acute trusts, via the DESCRO into an aggregation uh, tool, and for us it's been NHSI, uh, I think for you it's been the guys in IQVIA, then you get over a load of, a load of the hoops. Yeah, please. I, 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 I genuinely think there is a lot made of some of the IG issues, which is based on myths and legends <laughs> and things that potentially you're not allowed to do because everybody's scared of data security protection stuff. We have overtly asked the question around the data sharing that we've done in Derbyshire of the Information Commissioner's Office, and they're entirely content with what we are doing. That point notwithstanding, Back to the trust issue, it took me six months to get CSIRO, Data Protection Officer and Caldicott Guardian in just four organisations to agree with that sentiment. So you would kind of look at this as an outsider of the NHS going, how the devil did we manage to create a commissioning environment yeah. that genuinely cannot tell us which patients we are seeing in what care context mm -hmm. and linking Absolutely. it together? So I think there is a bit of a can this pass a man on the Clapham omnibus or woman on the Clapham omnibus test before we all run to the hills and say we can't do some of this stuff when palpably we can? A lot of it means you need to have good trusting relationships across the system to make this happen, but in and of itself, so long as you're sharing data securely, you can do that data sharing, particularly if it's for a primary care purpose, you can keep it with a patient identifiable label, label because GPs should know where their patients are going and they should be better able to integrate care. The, the notion they can't see that stuff is palpably crazy. So in this place that we are at the moment really in sort of a transitional stage to, to, to ICSs, is there a national f blueprint that people can pick up or is it just we all work through our individual issues? So I think that turns to the point I was making. 
there is this infrastructure yeah. which deals with the common sense points that uh, Lee's making and allows uh, Caldecott guardians and information governance leads to turn around and say, here is the rule, and in this case it's the desk row, that allows me to do that. But, but I think a bit of STP case law yeah. generated from some of the STP patches to say this is how you get around this stuff so we're not all starting from scratch would probably be quite timely. Yeah. Absolutely. So historically we've worked in, in pretty much organisational silos and, and we've just heard some really good pieces around system and working. I mean, how, how is the, the, the data uh, and the costing data available? Has that managed to remove some of those silos? I suppose it's the cultural change that's needed, which I, I find quite interesting uh, around uh, you know, the, 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 the systems really. Do you want me to have a go yeah, first? And, uh, so the type 1 diabetes example that Tabitha Randall uh, uh, has discussed uh, is a really good example where if you align your incentives, and in this mm. case there was a best practice tariff mm -hmm. aligned about uh, whole life costs for uh, patients with type, type 1 diabetes, where you had to demonstrate how the school nurse was working with the team from the uh, Community Healthcare Trust, was working with the Acute Trust. So that's schools, community and acute. And when you did that together, those silos moved away very quickly because you could see it was there for the patient. The case we're now looking at after taking a look at type 2 diabetes is those patients who are in acute hospitals who are also under the care of a community psychiatric team. And you will know this, that in your comorbidity data that you, you've got coded in, there's a flag there for, is this patient uh, under the care of a uh, mental health team or have they got a learning disability? You do some uh, analysis of, of that in the way that Jason demonstrated to us earlier on. You do some analysis of that and compare lengths of stay with patients with a mental health uh, condition from those who haven't. Look at the difference and there is the case for the hospital to reach out and make payments to the community and mental health trust to say, if you can help us get these patients out, we don't have to build extra beds. And I think, if I just add, a, that picks up Tim Slattery's question from uh, UCLH quite nicely in around uh, how much is being invested in preemptive strikes, if you like. So going back to that example you just gave, how much do we invest up front? Yeah. I, I, I think there's kind of three phases to this work. I think phase one is, particularly for an organisation like mine, which is a DGH, which its mission has got to be, how do you better integrate care with primary care? I think it's slightly harder for some of the tertiary providers, but for us, that's the only game in town. How do we work with local partners to work out how we keep people safer in their own homes? That's what we need to do. And I think the first phase of the work is absolutely in the space of, with this BI and analytical capability, where palpably haven't we got quite the right primary and community resource and what's the result of that in admissions we could correct for and where potentially haven't we got a model to outreach into care homes to keep patients safe in that environment phase one phase two then is information into general practice and secondary care which says these are your current complex patients how would you minister to them better to defragment their care and what wraparound to their care will avoid chronic disease and frailty crisis, and an acute admission which is unnecessary, phase two. Phase three, I think, is the far more ambitious bit about if you look at clusters of where this is occurring in my most deprived communities in North East Derbyshire, there's a far bigger piece of work we need to do about social prescribing, reaching out through education, mm -hmm. modern apprenticeships to avoid mental health issues in very alienated communities, which gets you into far bigger public health space. I think you've got to do the first bit and find a few bob and be working with local governments first before we're, as ever, with the public health agenda, kind of going, yeah, but great, when is it going to deliver a big saving into a very strapped health and care system? So if I just add to that as well, so Duncan and I were, I don't know if I'm mic'd or, so Duncan and I were talking earlier actually in terms of kind of mental health and acute and how it could work better together. And I, so for West Kent in our um, patch, 
There's an alliance incentive contract that's been in place, but it was in place with the acute trust and in place with the CCGs. So the community trust and the mental health trust were excluded from that. So about 15 months ago, the community trust therefore came part of that as well, and we were still excluded. So I'm pleased to say now we are part of that. Um, and we're having them conversations because they were actually looking at two particular pathways, which was dementia and frailty. Um, and we weren't around the, we, we just wasn't around the table. So they had no view around kind of mental health. Mm -hmm. Seeing though for dementia pathways, we're the ones that do the diagnosis. How could we not be around the table? So we are now, and we're starting to have them conversations around how we can work as a system. But it, it depends on what sector you're in and how far advanced you are. It just really depends on how well you're working together as providers. Mm. Um, and then as you said, there then comes how you're working with primary care. And what I would say from a mental health point of view is we do reach in quite well with our councils and mm. you know, primary care. So there are lots of opportunities. I think it's just about making sure that everyone's around the table with a voice. And I think that just leads quite nicely into uh, my next question here, which is around what needs to happen at a national level to support the measurement of value at population level? Do you mean that? Go on, I'll, I'll say something heretical at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Never, are you yeah. heretical? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so that. This is making up a lot of the work of the uh, Healthcare Costing for Value Institute, which you know, is partly laying this, uh, this forum on. Uh, and you saw it referred to in, in my last slide there about what are, the, what are the measures that you need to measure for outcome? What is the outcome that you put on, top, on the numerator over your cost to get a value equation working? Uh, and in type 2 diabetes, you start working on the six of them. Uh, and you saw them up there, HB1CA is a clotting agent uh, in the blood, and it's the presence of that enzyme that uh, tells the physicians how your progress with, uh, with your diabetes is working. The trouble is it's complex. And so in answer directly to the question that was asked, I think it is not a question for a panel of accountants. It's a question for a panel of doctors. Uh, and some of us have the privilege of, of sitting on consultant uh, appointment panels. Uh, and by every question I now use, and a number of my colleagues use, on consultant appoint appointment, oh, there, yeah. start again, yeah. appointment panels, is how do you measure your outcome? So you turn around to an interventional radiologist who goes, I measure my outcome by how much it costs, and I go, You've not got your head around this straight. Who's your customer? What does your customer want? You're doing a diagnostic tool, presumably, to help your surgeon or your medic. The customer isn't the patient. The customer is the person you're providing that diagnosis. What do they want? And we're not qualified to give you that. What we are qualified to do is to set the environment to say, that's the question. Help us answer it. Mm -hmm. Um, I, um, despite all appearances to the contrary, I've worked at a national level, quite close to the Department of Health, and when, when David Nicholson once said, whatever you do at a local level, don't look up for help or support, I think on this issue he's pretty much right. <laughs> the notion that at local system level yeah. we shouldn't be motivated to go, it is absurd that we are taking 90-year-old people who have fallen in a care home through an MRI scanner at three in the morning and can't we do something about that in terms of more proactive care as a series of people who've got something to do with health finance not trying to correct for that at a local level and waiting for somebody to tell us nationally that seems a bit errant and daft I don't think we need to wait for that request and I think the more we wait for this is how you need to do this stuff, and this is some national blueprint and architecture, mm -hmm. and here's some national guidance about how you do the data sharing, and I, I'm a little fearful we could be waiting for a goodly time for some good advice to come out of Wellington or Skipton House to tell us how to do some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think it's beholden on us to try and change the way we see some of the NHS after too long of an internal market and start to think through where is the value for patients? And if it was your mum 
what would you want the treatment and care to look like? And if it was your money, what would you want the treatment and care to look like? So, Lee, I've got a question from Lee. Um, Is it a good one? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask that. To, that's, that's what's popped up. I think you've in part answered this, but um, will the NHS be kept sustainable over the next five years through improvements to popula population health management and understanding allocative efficiency? And I suppose that's the killer question, isn't it? Um, I think most NHS organisations now, barring some stuff in the model hospital and model mental health organisation and model community organisation, we're, we're not bad now at running faster mm -hmm. on the spot. Mm -hmm. Yep. The notion that there's millions of pounds going to fall out of time in theatres or increased day case surgery as technology changes so we can do more and more of that stuff, I'm not persuaded that's the stuff that's going to keep the NHS sustainable over the next five years. We all know through our own experience, however, in terms of some access to primary care, in terms of rapid access to specialist opinion, some of this is going to have to change. Candidly, the notion you have to wait 18 weeks to see a cardiologist while you could be decompensating in that time, we need to find a mechanism that better understands what rapid access to clinical advice from secondary care keeps folk healthier and we need to outreach into primary care in a way that hasn't been enabled by a turnstile at the front of secondary care, a range of block payments in primary and community care at the very moment when we need to enhance the community and primary care offer with the right outreach from secondary care. But the intelligence to go, a number of us have been in the acute sector for too long. And, and if I had a quid for every time I was told, we're going to invest in the community, mm. <laughs> and all of a sudden my ED department's going to look like the Marie Celeste, yeah. that, that moment has never re arrived in my acute career to date. <laughs> However, some intelligence that says it's these patients in that care home where we're going to incisively intervene with community or primary care support, and we will evidence three months out those patients are no longer mm. arriving in ED, which enables me to close that six-bedded bay. That's the Nirvana. That's where we need to be, as opposed to some Punch and Judy show around, we'll invest in the community or primary care and buy some pattern of osmosis. The, the ED department will then be empty. Um, we need a bit more intelligent design to get us to that moment. Mm. So do you think we're going to be given the headroom to actually allow that to happen and make that happen. Because that actually, uh, there's a degree of risk in all of that, isn't there? There's a degree of you've got to actually try these things and, and, and you know, do they or do they not work? Do you think we'll be allowed that from, from in particular, regulators? Uh, I'm not <laughs> sure what the alternative is. Um, so for Derbyshire, 1.6 billion, purportedly we need to save 8.3% of the overall NHS system spend in a single year. Um, as far as I'm aware, there is no health system that saves 8 point something percent in a single year. McKinsey's and their big-brained people mm -hmm. sometimes listen to what they say. So the maximum you can deliver is about 5%. I, I think you need to be able to evidence in the regulatory space you're doing everything you can on this agenda mm -hmm. to the extent that we're going... It would be a remarkable coincidence, wouldn't it, if the national allocation worked perfectly, everybody had an improvement plan to sit within their shared control total, and we all had a rate of improvement to keep us all sustainable. I mean, mm. it, it would be a remarkable coincidence if that were true. What you've got to evidence at local level is you're doing all you can. Mm. Can I just add to yeah, that? Of course. So I agree with Lee. So I think within Kent and Medway, we need to find similar numbers, which is between 8 and 10%, because if we did nothing for five years, we'd have a a deficit of 650 million um, and we know we can't be in that position but I ag agree with what Lee's just said it's in our hands now isn't it so we have to be doing something as a system and all individual systems but I also think there's something about us sharing as you said as systems to learn from what we're all doing across the um, country because if we all go in isolation I don't think that's going to help either but I do think we're going to be given the space to just kind of get on with it especially as we've now had a 10-year plan published I think it's there in blue for isn't it and we should it's our distance it's up to us now to implement that Duncan yeah I guess my answer is it's mindful that we're at the national costing conference mm -hmm. 
not the FD's conference. No, yes. And, and if, if I may turn it that way, because I agree 100% with everything colleagues to the left have said, but the four of us are, are FD graded people, uh, and it's our job to put the umbrella up. It's our job to give you guys, who uh, you may think I was just sucking up to you. <laughs> All them. And I was. All them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was. But, I, you know, I have seen the international evidence. I've sat in rooms like this in Montenegro, in southeast Europe, in just across the water, in, in, in France, in the Netherlands, Holland, in the Middle East, uh, and thankfully the, these nice folk in HFMA, because I'm an ordinary member, yet another pug, uh, paid for me to go down to uh, Australia. The room's full of people like you guys aren't a touch on you. They're just not a touch. You, you've, you are absolutely, what you guys are doing is incredible. Uh, and it would be nice to say thank you for that, but I'm not going to. I'm going to say you've got to do more. <laughs> okay, and the thing you've got to do more of is what you've heard about today which is get out there, engage with the clinicians. Professor Tobi, Toby Tony Young is leader of the NHS Entrepreneur Scheme. You, those of you who follow it on social media, there's lots of stuff. There are young physicians and surgeons, therapists, radiologists, perfusionists out there with cracking ideas who would love you to help prove what they've got is a great idea. You've all got research and innovation departments in your teams. You've got clinical colleagues that you work with. We've got to get you the space to go and do mm. those other things. We've got to convince our other FD colleagues to go and give you the mm. space to do those things. And Sue and I and Lee, she, we spend a lot of our time doing that. But you've got to do it. And it's brave, but you've got to go out there and meet those docs and go and say, how can I help you? They'll so, bite your hand off. Absolutely. Totally agree, Lee. I know you're, you're itching to come in there. <laughs> I, I, I am. And even though it's odd, you've got to bear in mind, if we were in the States, they would give their eye teeth yes. for that NHS ID we've got. Mm. If you look at what the Veterans Association are trying to do, what Kaiser try and do yeah. in terms of linking together care and a primary care investment, yeah. they would give their eye teeth mm. for the level of data we've got in the NHS to better shape and tailor care. I guess there's something around costing practitioners, particularly in the STP space. To what extent are you meeting up with your mental health and community colleagues Absolutely. in that STP space and just thinking through how do we get into some of that pathway value Absolutely. conversation? So there's there's absolutely a robust level of costing data within the organisation. And, and if we don't have that, all of this stuff falls about on its ears if we haven't got that. But I do think, for all of us, a growing recognition about what happens in other bits of the health of, and care anatomy, community trust, mental health trust, the work that goes on in social care, it's critical we're a bit more outward focused in some of that work. And costing practitioners, as was being explained earlier, they've got loads of data there. Go in and have that conversation about where, where have we got some compatibility between what's going on in the local community trust or the integrated trust or dealing with what have we got in the CCG with primary care data that might give us some real insight in terms of broader, a broader transformation of care than just within our own organisation. We're in a really good place to do this stuff. It's not going to be easy peasy, but we're in a good spot. I, I think that's absolutely, I think it's just stressing really around how we are moving towards this system working and actually what part we all can play in that. That's the, that's the big thing about bringing out the sort of almost the strategic direction is around actually, you know, we actually need this data and this is the most, probably the most important time in, in, in costume practitioners uh, world that I've known. Um, can I just touch on um, a question from the audience uh, and links uh, partly to my question as well which is around full cost average costing and probably links to the tariff as well so does payment by results now uh, and the pricing structures that we apply within our systems is there still a place for that especially when we're looking at some contracts at the moment are block funded some are 
uh, actually in the acute sec sector, particularly uh, cost and volume through PBR. Should I? Yeah. Should mm. I start us? That seems to be the convention. Please do, yeah. <laughs> Please do. Yeah, go on. Yeah, go on. So, what are you costing? You know, I, I can remember with Scott and some of the team from, from Nottingham uh, facing down a, a, our annual uh, costing audit. And uh, I said, yeah, I'll have a bit of fun with the auditors. It's a bit of sport. It's got to be had. Uh, and uh, they came in and started quoting some stuff to us that they didn't like that we'd done in our costing methodology. I said, yeah, but our doctors wanted it done that way because it gives them better insight. And they said, but this isn't the way we want it for the for tariff and standardisation. Don't you understand? You're doing it for us. And I said, no, you better understand. We're doing it for the doctors. We're doing it to give them insight. I think all this stuff, it, it's important to get right. and You can't go completely rogue on it. But you've got to understand the people you're doing this for yeah. is your colleagues working for your patients in your patch, not some bureaucrat working up with, uh, with Lee's old mates. <laughs> Sorry, Lee. Follow on from that. <laughs> <laughs> Should I follow on? Yes, yeah, yeah. So I suppose coming from mental health at this moment in time rather than an acute, what we're doing, what I was talking about, we're doing for a very different reason, which is we're doing it because of the clinical piece and wanting to have that conversation in the organisation because we're not driven by tariffs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, which has been the big eye opener mm -hmm. for me is right. a block contract. So that isn't the thing that's driving us. What's driving us is to get our costing accurate so we can cost our pathways and have them conversations and do the work that we're doing at KMPT at the moment. It isn't the tariff piece. And there's a debate and it's been going on for ages isn't it as to whether there will be PBR and mental health as to kind of as you said now so in acute we're seeing people go back to block or aligned incentives it's changing around us again do we ever think we're going to get PBR in mental health I would probably say probably not at this stage but it doesn't mean going back to what Duncan was saying we should stop or you should stop what you're doing which is doing all the costing because Absolutely. that's what adds value because that's how we're going to change the clinical pathways and improve patient care it will continue to be important yeah. that we understand the differential costs of treatment and care in different organisations and can run that down and go, why is a hip replacement over there cost 2x of the hip replacement yeah. over there? That, that isn't ever going to go, go away, away no. in my view. Um, I think we are probably entering an era, I hope, contingent on what happens with primary legislation, plurality and choice, where there's a greater emphasis of what's the total cost of the system, how do we ensure we've got the right clinicians intervening on a more timely basis, slightly more impactfully than a 1948 definition of inpatient, outpatient day case, which we are still largely costing around. So I think there is a piece of work to do to go, if we are really trying to look at system costs and ensuring we've got enough resource in the system to deal with technological change and an ageing population, a more frail population, and earlier onset chronic disease in middle age, what does that look like? Mm. Uh, and I think the days of chasing EBITDA margin on the mm. wrong widgets mm. hopefully is long behind us. Yeah. And I've never been persuaded there's been much correlation between the things you happen to make money on in a secondary care environment and the absolute clinical value associated with that. Mm. So we've got to move that debate on. So a question from the, from the floor. So who did you initially involve to get the ICS project off the ground? The doctors. Short, short and, and sweet there. <laughs> but there was a conference. Uh, we battered our way into it of how doctors were working together in the local ICS, ran off on, on the back of that. Uh, yeah, speak to your FD, speak to the people in your strategy teams who are working those ICS invites, get yourself an invite to those sessions, find yourself a doc, they want to know you. Mm. Um, public health and local government colleagues because they see the world in a different way mm. yeah. 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 to that which we have seen from an NHS perspective mm. and they're quite good at looking at us and going, 
why are you all rowing about where <laughs> yeah, the problem sits? Absolutely, absolutely. As opposed to having the conversation about what are you going to do more fundamentally about the problem? Absolutely. Are there any more questions from the floor? No? I think we've pretty much covered all of the areas uh, today in terms of the line of questioning. I'd just like to thank you and ask everyone uh, to, to thank our speakers and, and panel in the usual way, please. Thank you.